Hello and welcome to the Agora Politics Podcast. This is your host, Alex Mershak. Today I'm speaking with Benjamin Boyce. Benjamin is a YouTuber as well as the host of the Voice of Reason podcast. We talk about the Evergreen controversy, that notorious student protest that happened at the Evergreen State College a few years back. Some of you may remember it. Benjamin was a student there at, at the time and therefore got to witness some of the events that unfolded and has since been documenting the entire controversy and its after effects on his channel. We talk about intersectionality, Lindsay Shepard, and what we can do to perhaps move past tribalism. Without further ado, I give you Benjamin Boyce. Hello and welcome to Agora Politics. This is your host, Alex Mershak. Today I'm speaking with Benjamin A. Boyce. Benjamin is the YouTube channel, Benjamin A. Boyce, as well as the podcast, Voice of Reason. And you can find him at Benjamin A. Boyce on Twitter. The reason I wanted to have Ben on today is because uh, he was a former uh, student of the Evergreen State College, as well as uh, a graduate of the Ever- Evergreen State College as well as uh, one of the most prolific YouTubers in terms of documenting uh, that controversy. So I was interested in having Ben on to get his perspective on the culture wars that are sort of admiring the the new left in all kinds of controversies, as well as see where he's at uh, these days, a few years on on from the event, uh, to see how his perspective has changed and what he thinks is going on at the university. Benjamin, it's uh, so great to have you. I really appreciate it. This is great. Thanks a lot, Alex. So I want to just, for for some of my listeners who may not know exactly uh, what happened during that controversy and um, why it's interesting to get your perspective on it, could you just uh, go over briefly, and I know you're going to have the most concise timeline because you've documented it so well, uh, Mm -hmm. the series of events, uh, sort of the TLDR version of Evergreen State and what happened there? Why okay. you started documenting it? Maybe we can get into that. Okay, um, let let's do a little bit of a history of the Evergreen State College. The Evergreen State College was founded in like 1968, and its doors opened in 1972. And it was founded specifically to be an alternative or experimental higher education or college. Mm-hmm. And the way that it was set up initially and to this day is that students take, instead of taking a variety of classes, you take one program that's generally about 16, 12 to 16 credits that lasts anywhere from one quarter, which is 10 weeks, to the entire year, which would be, I guess, 30 weeks. And what you would do is you sign up to a course that would have multiple teachers from a variety of different expertises or expertise disease. Mm-hmm. I don't know. How do you pluralize that? But, um, so I'll just give you a, a, an example of probably the most evergreen course that I took. It was sure. called Dark Romantics, and that was in the 2013-2014 school year. And we had a writing professor, we had a philosopher professor, a history professor, an arts professor, and then a photography professor. And all of those professors spoke about one general topic, which would be the you know France between the uh, that French Revolution up to the Fond de Sacre, which was um, I guess the the end the beginning of the 20th century and ending of the 19th century, and so we we took that period of history in that country and we studied it from a variety of different levels. We studied the art, the philosophy, the literature, and the history uh, of the different things that were going on during that time. And we spent that entire year focused on that. And in the third quarter, we went to France and we, you know, everybody had a independent project. Evergreen's really big on independent projects. And you drafted up your independent project, your research project. And then we went and hands-on studied the culture or the aspects of the culture that you wanted to study. So that's kind of evergreen. Uh, that's the model of evergreen. Evergreen's always been known as a very lefty 
very progressive or proggy, like extremely uh, left school, extremely liberal. And that amounted to it having kind of a controversy about every 10 years for some reason. Uh Uh, At the end of uh, the end of last century, they invited, well, they had a, the graduation speaker was on the death row for killing a, a cop. And then in 2018, there was a big riot there where they attacked police cars and there's footage of them like just going to town on the police. And then in the, in 2017, they had what's made it now world famous for being, you know, the Evergreen State College controversy, as, as you call it. They had a, a series of protests that lasted about a week um, where the campus descended into mob rule to effectively anarchy, mm-hmm. which sounds really big. There's a lot of nuance. It wasn't necessarily that dangerous for the entire week, but what the students did was they live streamed all of their protests and they posted it to the internet expecting that they were in the right because they were standing up for specifically, it was a a modification of black lives matter movement. Um, and I, I had been going there and I watched over the 2016, 2017 school year, the, the angst of the student body get more and more dramatic or histrionic even, um, where they would just protest this thing, protest that thing, protest and protest and protest. Um, and kind of when Trump got elected, that like sent the whole school into shock and that kind of laid the groundwork for uh, the spring protest. So at the end of the year, about two weeks before the uh, you know, the school year was done, two weeks before I was to graduate, the students decided um, that due to Due to an incident, a very specific incident that they used to galvanize the student body against the administration and against the police, um, they, they used this incident to justify a, a, a completely uh, beyond the pale protest, just a fabulously insane um, dynamic that, that ruled the college. And what's interesting is that the, the administration kind of bowed to the students and let them take over, let them act the way that they wanted to act and uh, called off the cops and acted really strangely from, from the outside. Looking in, you see all these students acting very just insane. Mm-hmm. And you see that the administration's response to that was very lacking or very odd. Like like the, the president just let them tell him when to go pee, you know, and told him where to stand and how to, how to move his body, uh, just allowed them, uh, he allowed them to treat him like he was their, their doll basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I had, I had watched that. I'd watched the behavior of the students that year, but I started going there in 2013 in the winter of 2013. And I, I saw that the programming was being you know, applied to the students through these various orientations and these workshops and these seminars and these lectures, always going through the same um, current uh, manifestation of progressive or intersectional politics, just being put into the kids' heads that race matters more than anything mm-hmm. that sa- you know sexism and racism and you know tr- all this all these different phobias they're all the foundation of society and we have to resist them we have to dismantle them and the watching the theory translate into the practice was just um i had fr- front row seats to watching intersectionality actually be implemented not as a academic ideal um, but as an, an activist actuality. Uh, and uh, so when that stuff happened, I was deeply offended by the way that the students were acting, but I was even more affected, uh, offended by the ways in which the administration and certain sectors of the professoriate had placed these ideas and the justification for these behaviors into the minds of the students directly. And so when that happened, I saw that the internet was just eating this stuff up, eating this footage up. You can look at it. You can look at my channel or if you uh, just Google Evergreen State protest, um, Google's kind of suppressed my particular channel uh, from popping up. Uh, but you can find <laughs> the that. behavior. It is, yeah, that's a whole other story. I don't, I don't want to get into conspiracy theories right now. But anyways, um, 
But when I saw the, the way that YouTube was just this self-generated content uh, you know, factory, which mm-hmm. I had really, you know, I, I browsed it every, before then and, you know, played with it a little bit before then. But when I saw what it was doing with the Evergreen State College and when I saw what the actual the mainstream media was doing with the Evergreen State College story, I saw this huge gap in making all this stuff fit together. They would either criticize the students or criticize the administration, but nobody had what I had access to, which would be all these lectures and all these documents and knowing which, because uh, it's a public college, I have free reign to ask for all the documents that I want, whether or not they'll give it to me in a timely manner is, a, right. is another question. But I know I knew the questions to ask. I knew the, the documents to get. I knew the videos to get, where to look for. And then I started publishing those. And that kind of just over time translated into me doing this work. Uh, I don't get paid full time, but I act like I do, you know, uh, <laughs> just doing it all the time now. So that's kind of an overview. I hope that that was sufficient. Did you have any – Did are there any cracks in that that we can fill out? Um, no, I mean that was a really good uh, summary. It's a, it's a long conflict. If you go visit Benjamin's uh, channel, you can actually see how, how much content he was able to put up on that just explaining it. I think there's one playlist with over with, – with not over, but I think a dozen videos – uh, just well, I the I have an official documentary that's going to be twenty four episodes, and I'm oh. on nineteen now. And then I have the organic, just me going through the documents, me going through the footage, mm-hmm. um, expose Evergreen, which was uh, me mocking the kids calling their movement expose Evergreen, <laughs> um, which is at, almost at we're at ninety nine episodes on that one, um, and I'm working on the hundredth episode for that for that. So wow, which is which is actually. Um, I, I don't mean to toot my own horn at all, like because actually Evergreen is very much suited for a particular individual, somebody mm-hmm. who's obsessive, uh, completionist, and independent. And the the way that Evergreen works best is for people who already have you know uh, either experience or. Um, motivation, a significant amount of motiv- motivation in order to do a lot of independent work and to really, you know, what they call dig deep, which is one of the mottos that they, they've come up with. Um, so, so my, in, in, on, on one meta level, my thoroughness with this project is a testament to the power of the evergreen institute, uh, not the institution, but the, uh, the, the method of, of teaching or the, the evergreen model, while it's completely a deconstruction and uh, a criticism of the evergreen institution as it stands right now. Yeah. And so Brett Weinstein, um, the evolutionary biologist, Stein. Weinstein, sorry about that, who, uh, I have to do it. <laughs> who's famous uh, more or less for getting caught up in this mess and, um, you know, essentially refusing to leave the campus when they had asked uh, all the white men to leave or all the white people, I, I believe to leave for the, um, for the day. There was the day of absence. Uh, yeah, that, that we could, we could spend If you want to, we can unpack that a little bit. I think it's important to be a little bit nuanced on that because the, you know, the Fox news narrative is that, you know, the, the white people were told to go away. Hmm. Um, it's not exactly like that, but it reads exactly like that. So, but, but ever, but Brett said, I don't think it's right to ask another group to, to single out people of a certain race and tell them to, to go away from a public campus that that's actually an act of racism, um, which is what got him under the crossfires. crossfires. Yeah. He also refused to not, uh, go to work that day as well. Right. Yeah, yeah. He, he said it, it, I'm, it's going to be a protest. I'm protesting. I'm going to I'm going to actually show up and teach the people who are paying me to get taught by me. You know? Yeah, <laughs> which was a little email that was discovered and published in the Cooper Point Journal and passed around, and that formed the that and another email thread um, formed the basis of why the students focused on him, even though he wasn't mm-hmm. really. He was just the first stop in a week-long protest. Um, but because of his position and just how thoroughly rational this man is, his story um, became uh, the you know the the the, the fluctuation point. I, there's there's got to be a term like that's where the lightning of attention landed on because you have one character that that's yeah he that that's where that's where everything collapsed on him mm-hmm. with regards to telling the evergreen story. That's how you make sense of it with the first pass. So but did you know, you know him before this controversy? Did you have him as a professor? 
No, I didn't. Uh, I didn't actually meet him until his wife Heather Hying reached out to me, seeing my videos, and uh, congratulated me or thanked me for doing the work that I was doing. And then we we met up and and had, had he, he's uh, he doesn't do beer, so I think we had wine. <laughs> That's funny. I don't drink either uh, at all. Anyway. Um, Cool. Well, I was just saying, um, I, I didn't want to make this all about Brett. Uh, obviously, his story is an independent thing, and he's done a lot as well as his brother to get that uh, out out to the mm-hmm. public so people know what happened. Um, but I did want to just bring him up because he's one of the people who has also noted this important uh, aspect as well, which is that there was this unique curriculum that Evergreen State College had that allowed the students and the teachers to really go really, really in-depth on a subject, I believe, for a semester long. Is that how long the courses were? At least a semester. Or yeah. a, well, it's called a quarter, so, yeah. Okay. And uh, my question for you is, do you think, as you've pointed out, like there's this trade-off between uh, this could be a very good teaching style for someone who's a self-starter, who's very independent, who wants to complete large long-term mm-hmm. projects on their own, which I see that you've done <laughs> since leaving the, the institution, so great work. Um, but there's this downside here, which is that if you take somebody and they're only getting instruction in this one method from this one source of knowledge, uh, over an extended period of time, would you describe what was happening to the students there as indoctrination? Well, it, it, on the level of the, when the current president, George Bridges came on in 2015, and his first words to the campus were was that, and I'm paraphrasing, that the civil rights movement has done a lot to forward our nation, but in the convening years, we, we've stalled and we need to focus on fixing racism specifically. He he spearheaded and he put in charge people whose whose main focus was on, you know, righting the wrongs of, of racial history or something like, like, like the 1619 project, which is the New York times right. uh, attempt to rewrite American history with sl- slavery or black oppression as the, as the, uh, you know, the, the, the basis of everything that has happened in the history of this country. So on the level of the administration, on the level of the, of the college, there was, uh, when George Bridges got on, that became the mo- the modus operandi of you know the, the the official stance of the college was that we are going to participate in anti-racist, anti-oppression work. So on that level, you you got a lot of exposure and a lot of participation from all different you know uh, activities and different programs would would put you in line to receive this sort of education, which I would argue is indoctrination because simply because every one of these seminars, lectures, workshops, etc., never debated the claims that were were being put forth. You never had a discussion that would unpack whether or not we live in a racist, racist society, which would unpack whether or not privilege is the central focus of how inter, uh, individual human and individuals inter, interrelate with one another. So on that level, it was indoctrination. But what you're talking about specifically was, and I would have to agree with you, was that if you had a professor with significant um, significant charisma and dedication to an ideology, it would be very easy, and it was very easy, for certain professors to abuse that relationship between the students and the the professor, because the students would only be, you know, interacting with that professor for, you know, 10 weeks, but then kind of go under their wing and adopt their ideology and become a part. It was a breeding ground for, you uh, various different schools of thought, but also various different cults. Um, I, while I was there, I would joke that it, we should call it whatever green because <laughs> you can get away with anything there. You can get away with doing you know, like some astounding piece of work, but you could also get away with doing nothing at all. You could go through the whole system uh, without that. But there is evidence. I don't have direct evidence, but circumstantial evidence that a lot of the key protesters um, were – I guess indoctrinated, but we're carrying out the wishes or the will 
or the ideas of a certain subset of the professoriate. Um, and I don't necessarily need to name them, but there was, there's a couple of very key players in this game whose direct, you know, who, the, the students who studied under them were the ones who were leading the charge with the protests. Yeah. And so uh, what I wanted to focus on a little bit here is also the way in which what was being taught to them was actually being executed by the students perfectly well. Uh, Hmm. And so I guess my take on the situation was when we talk about the mob violence that erupted, when we talk about the, you know, pseudo anarchy uh, running the college and students overrunning the faculty and the administrators and really having total, um, total mob control over the dynamics of this institution and making all these demands uh, for certain equity provisions and mm-hmm. uh, race-based proposals for organizing you know, every mm-hmm. aspect of the university. What I wanted to emphasize here was that this isn't like an accidental thing of, oh, they heard some, uh, you know, really out there lefty ideas, which I think is how it often gets portrayed Mm. on places like Fox News. I know that like Tucker Carlson, for example, has had Brett on to speak about Mm. his experience. Um, But that, that no, actually like the, the thing that they're being taught is explicitly to go forth and make it your life's mission to do this, right. To become Mm. an activist and, what become an activist means doesn't mean necessarily that you have a particular cause that you're devoted to, but actually that you're devoted to uh, rearranging or deranging the structure mm. of society and all the social institutions mm. that come with it in a way that fits this intersectional agenda. Mm. Um, yeah. would, you, would you say that that's an accurate portrayal, that it, it wasn't an accident, that this is sort of the students actually learning perfectly what they were supposed to do? Well, I, I, I want to not agree with you, um, okay. just for the sake of dialogue, yeah. <laughs> but there's no way that I can disagree with that statement because my main point is to, sh- is to, to tie directly to tie lines between what's the being said by the authority and then what's being said and done by the, uh, by the student activists and the student activists during the protest say, you taught us this. And the, you know, Naima Lowe, who's one of the professors who became famous for blowing up on other professors. And, um, she, she's kind of a central figure, the anti Brett, her and Brett, if you tell the story as a, you know, as a good versus evil kind of thing and collapse it into that binary, uh, which I try not to do, but if you would do that, if you were given or prone to do that, Naima Lowe would be the opposite of Brett. Naima Lowe's teaching grievances. Naima Lowe's breaking everybody up into race. Naima Lowe's constantly, who, she's a black woman. She's got um, some physical disabilities. She has uh, excessive weight, um, is always putting that front and center, is always putting her disadvantage front and center, is always saying I've seen that, that pattern before. It's very disturbing. That I have no power, that I have no privilege, that, that, that you know, like, that I, I, I am powerless. Therefore, mm-hmm. you have to obey me, which, which is a contradiction in terms. Uh, or, you know, it's, it's just a, it's an oxymoronic, you know, event. But because she has the backing of this institutionalized narrative that the minority needs to now become, you know, the, the first, the last need to now become first. Mm-hmm. The, the goal of equity, they call it equity, and they call it equity because it's not equality. They call it, they, they specifically say that if you think this is equality, it's not equality. They say that at Evergreen, and now they're saying it explicitly in the Washington state government that we are not, it's no longer enough to just be created equal or to treat each other with equality. We need equity. And what equity is, is an equalization. So what you do is you start to assign people privilege points and oppression points, and then you weight their their contributions or their their authority, or you assign them authority to pace, uh, based on how many uh, oppressions they have. And theoretically, theoretically, yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's theoretically, not even necessarily, I, I, really lived experience. It's often they're referring to um, hardships uh, that their ancestors may or may not yeah, have faced. Statistical likelihoods, yeah. Mm-hmm. But the way that they implement that. There was a, in one of my recent episodes, I took some footage from a documentary about the cultural revolution in China, which I I can't remember the exact year that that happened, but Mao uh, empowered the students to take over the country. And what the students did was they ended up, you know, 
taking their teachers and vilifying them and and graffitiing all over the place and you know weeding out the capitalists and and I just I put the footage next right next to what happened at Evergreen and one of the little quotes that I found in that documentary was that there was this idea that we're not trying to we're, we're not against the capitalist individuals we're 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 against the capitalist class we're against the mindset but in effect when that is put into effect the, the, the mob cannot think or do anything with uh, an abstraction. They need to attack the privileged individual, and that is what they end up doing. So there's, there's a number of different vectors in which uh, what they were being taught was explicitly um, not only you know, like a manifestation of that ideology, but the only possible way for that ideology to actually be put into place. And I, I think that you know, I, I think that there's probably a lot of nuance uh, or reasons not to call it cultural Marxism. But if you look at the history of Marxist revolutions, you see the same exact behavior happening at Evergreen. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, just you switch out capitalist with racist. I, I would totally agree. My family uh, is actually from uh, the former Soviet Union. And uh, so I was very disturbed when I saw the similarities mm. between the sort of the Kulakism um the campaigns against the kulaks in the USSR, as well as I've, I've made comparisons myself to the um, the Maoist revolution, particularly the s- struggle sessions. Um, mm. I actually have a brother who went to uh, an even smaller college, the Kalamazoo, um, Kalamazoo College here in Michigan. And even while he was there as an undergrad a few years ago, he, had to, he, he would tell me um, that... Uh, he would be in discussions where he would be, by virtue of his um, by his skin color and gender, uh, he would be told that he was sort of precluded from having certain opinions or being involved in certain discussions. Uh, mm-hmm. And he also noted to me being a little bit disturbed by witnessing that when a student did screw something up, like they said something that was improper or politically incorrect or not quite with – uh, the proper lingo uh, on that hyper progressive campus um, mm-hmm. that there would be this almost Maoist struggle session where you, you would be the other and it wasn't it wasn't even but being done by the faculty. This is not uh, as the media often portrays it. Oh, these crazy left wing professors. Sure, they may be doing the teaching, but a lot of the uh, I want people to understand that a lot of the excesses in terms of behavior are actually being done by students. And maybe you can you can blame that on oh well they haven't been taught how to properly deal wrestle with competing ideas in a democracy that's another mm-hmm. argument entirely um, but the point was that the students themselves would then go through this process of public shaming where they would just demand that you recant what you just said and that you uh, mm-hmm. you know iterate a, a bunch of gobbledygook that basically affirms. Um, your commitment to the dominant ideology, uh, and then and that's what you needed in order to get back into the social group. If you didn't do that, you were now part of the out group, which means you're the enemy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I guess one of the one of the focuses of this podcast is figuring out how we move back past a little bit these tribal dynamics that we seem locked in at the moment. Um, there is a, a unfortunately like a game theoretic. Um, state that we're kind of stuck in, which is Mm -hmm. that, uh, for one side to, uh, one of the things that I noticed that was a problem, I guess, trying to explain this is that, um, when the intellectual dark web came out, the IDW, which Brett is associated with, uh, Mm -hmm. and a number of other people who've outspoken against this sort of, uh, left-wing craziness on college campuses, I've also been associated with people like Jordan Peterson, et cetera. They Mm -hmm. tried to create a group that whose fundamental premise was that they were non-tribal. And I think that that's not only a, a, a oxymoronic uh, as we've been getting to, but I think it's actually impossible. Um, and so I wanted to ask for you as somebody who I, I feel like you're put into a strange position as someone who went to this college, who has their degree granted from this institution, and therefore uh, I, I would presume is proud of you're proud of the education that you received there uh, insofar as you met wonderful professors who took you through interesting in-depth programs and it changed your ideas about the world. Maybe 
uh, your experiences there even contributed, as you've said, uh, or alluded to, to your ability to work on the projects you're working on now. Um, how do you wrestle with feeling like somebody who is maybe been outgrouped in certain ways by having certain dissident beliefs about the reigning uh, left so far? I mean, have you have you had to struggle at all with uh, finding a political home or a sense of political homelessness? I've gone through quite a long yeah. period. Yeah, yeah, I understand that, and um, I and I saw that early on. So when I started speaking about Evergreen right after the protest and the spring of I, my first video was June eleventh of uh, twenty seventeen, and I went through and I dedicated myself just to talking about this and getting documents and going through and editing video and just exhuming this. And I spent a really just, that's, that was the whole focus of my, um, of, of my work. And then something happened in, uh, I, I, I was feeling like I needed to branch out. And what happened was there was this college up in Canada called Wilfrid Laurier university. Mm -hmm. And Lindsay there was Shepard. this young woman with, named Lindsay Shepard who showed a two minute Jordan Peterson clip, uh, of Jordan Peterson, who was not yet Jordan Peterson, as we know him now, uh, arguing on, I think it's called the view or maybe it's not called the view. Um, it, it's some some uh, Canadian uh, talking uh, show, and he's he's arguing with a them about pronouns and about this Bill C sixteen, which would uh, arguably maybe or maybe not enforce people to speak in a certain way about other individuals, depending on what those other individuals want you to say about them, and with legal ramifications if you didn't fall in line and, and change the pronouns to whatever that person wants. So Lindsay Sh uh, Shepard shows that two minute clip doesn't, so far as I know, doesn't come down one way or another. She's just talking about language. What do we do with, with pronouns now? And then she gets taken aside and for 40 minutes, what she records, she is submitted to a struggle session where three people in power are, are circling around her and, and breaking her down and for, you know, just like punishing her basically without any point, just punishing her for, you know, doing this awful thing of showing a different viewpoint than what is the established viewpoint. And when I heard that recording, there was a number of different dynamics. I'm like, oh, this is the same thing that happened at Evergreen. And, and what happened was that a media circus began around Wilfrid Laurier, a bunch of footage was produced, and I started to apply my, uh, you know, am I right in, in breaking Evergreen down here? Does it translate to breaking down this, a similar situation? Does it hold up? Does my critique hold up a, under a different viewpoint? And I'm sorry, this is a very circuitous way to answer your, your, um, your, your question, but with Wilfred Laurier, it wasn't about race. It was about trans rights or about uh, trans uh, trans individuals, transsexuals. Mm -hmm. And there was so there was this identity, there was this marginalized identity, and there was this expectation that this marginalized identity should not only be beyond critique, but should be sheltered and coddled and basically obeyed by everybody else in the group. And the with Evergreen, that was all about the black students or particular particular black students who wanted to cash in on their blackness in this way. Um, and then at Wilfrid Laurier, there was, uh, you know, this other thing, which is totally not related to race called gender identity being played out. And when I went through and I started critiquing that, I was, I was approached by several transsexuals, you know, through DMs and messages and stuff saying, I, I don't want to have anything to do with these activists at all. They're claiming that they're speaking for me, but I just want to live my life. There's this other situation going on mm -hmm. that, you know, that, that, that I'm trying to deal with by all this other stuff that I'm going through. I don't want to be, you know, I don't want my identity as a trans individual to be associated whatsoever with the, with these totalitarian nut jobs. I don't want to do that. And what that it, it just in the back of my head it started me thinking about what is transsexualism what is transgenderism evergreen had forced me to start speaking in pronoun all the time you know like you go into a room and like i'm a he him and all that stuff which i was just really annoyed by um because of, for a number of different reasons but i didn't actually think through what was going on with these trans individuals and that led me to start to investigate and interview these individuals and this and this is my point I saw that the only way to destroy collectivism 
not is not to destroy it. The only way to defeat tribalism is not to defeat tribalism because you would have to create a tribe to do that. What you do is you platform people who are more more interested in being themselves and discovering themselves and and working out their relationship as honestly as possible between their own identity or individuality and the world and society and and to focus more and more less and less on the on the political sphere and more and more on the personal sphere and then by centering the personal then investigating why do certain beliefs or certain ideologies work for this person not work for that person why is a feminist a feminist why is an activist an activist why is this person a conservative why is this person a liberal but not not saying this is a liberal, I'm going to talk to a liberal, saying I'm going to talk to this individual and then work my way through that. So I've avoided, and because of my history, I, I was never allowed to have a tribe of my own because I was always moving every year when I was a kid. My parents would just move us and move us and move us and move us. So I've always been outside looking in. Mm-hmm. But the, the, and the only way to get in is to make a, a real honest connection. Well, mm-hmm. one, to tell jokes, you know, and be funny <laughs> on the on the, you know, on the community level, but to really like anchor my sense of self in relationship to another self. And, uh, I don't know if that answered your question, but maybe it led to more. No, that was a wonderful answer. Actually. I really love that. Uh, I actually view, um, the mission of this podcast in terms of why, what we're trying to have one-on-one dialogue to upgrade our theories Mm -hmm. of politics. Uh, one of the Foundations of this podcast as well is that as individuals, in order to not, in, in order for humanity not to destroy ourselves or each other, mm. uh, we're going to have to actually individually upgrade our own software, our own, you know, we're, we're mm. running on these very ancient evolutionary tribal circuitry, mm. right? Mm. And uh, mm. the complexity and the sheer scale of modern society has gotten to the point where if we don't get some of these impulses under control, if we don't get some of our, um, our violence of our, um, uh, appetite for war, conflict, mm-hmm. et cetera, uh, we, we're probably going to reach a point where, you know, everyone said already, you know, our, our power has exceeded our wisdom for quite some time now, at least mm-hmm. since the mm-hmm. advent of the hydrogen bomb. So, um, the idea uh, for me around de, uh, escalating our political um, polarization is also centered around this concept of, okay, we're going to have to do it one brain at a time. There's not mm-hmm. necessarily going to be a very, uh, a, a, a large scale, scalable, interoperable ideology, something like classical liberalism, uh, which you can just sort of get running between everybody's ears and then we'll suddenly all mm-hmm. just get along and be tolerant of one another. I think well, that that's yeah. a little bit lost. There's a, there's a lot of different ways to go and uh, to get into that, and I am not an expert in any of the ways that I think would be there to to you know start to propose a solution. But when you were talking about circuitries, these ancient circuitries, there's this word that I can never pronounce, and I get corrected because I say babushka dolls, dolls and I know it's not babushka; it's matryoshka. Matry- the you're, Russian, you're from the Russia. Russian dolls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's it? What's it called? What's the word? Nesting dolls is. Well, I mean, nesting dolls dolls is how you say it in English. I don't know what the word word is in Russian. Okay. So I'm thinking this, and this is just an off the hip idea that these circuitries are like those nesting dolls where you get to individualism after you have like a hierarchy of needs, you know, like you you have to be able to drink and eat before you can start to think and you have to be able, you know, you have to have shelter before you can have all these other things. So eventually you get to the point where somebody can have a nuanced uh, interaction or start to build, you know, a, a very deep, rich internal life, you know, something along the lines of a novel where somebody just has all these a very rich internality compared to the externality. And I'm speaking in terms of a story, mm-hmm. right? In order for a story to operate, you have to start with the myth and eventually build up to uh, arguably whether or not a postmodern novel can exist or not. But at least the modern novel doesn't come until you've, you've developed all these other substrates of the story. So I wonder if the circuitry that we're seeking needs to have um, or needs to be able to uh, coexist within, nested within all these other circuitries. And one of those, one of those baser circuitries would be the tribal circuitry. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. Um, I spoke with uh, an evolutionary anthropologist actually on the first episode of the show. Mm-hmm. Um, 
called Cody Moser. Uh, he goes by the handle um, Littlefoot on Twitter. Oh, and yeah. yeah. Uh, and Littlefoot and I were actually talking at that time about this, uh, um, about adaptationism and about basically the modularity of the brain, right? So all of our, mm-hmm. um, we, we think of our emotional system and our, our rational system or our prefrontal cortex as being separate, but really they're just sort of laying on top of each other. And a lot of our um, evolutionary emotional circuitry, things like disgust sensitivity, uh, some of the, the fear circuitry, et cetera, uh, it, 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 it gets activated in modern times with novel stimulus, right? And so mm-hmm. really what's happening is that there's a modularity where we're repurposing an older, uh, deeper structure yeah. – to mm-hmm. deal with a new circumstance because you can't actually yeah. evolve the physical brain as fast as mm-hmm. the environment around it is changing. Right, the cultural brain. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, th- I think about that a lot. That's very um, aptly illustrated by the way in which Twitter works, where a offensive event will happen at a very specific time and a specific location, and then will be reproduced to interact with every, let's just say somebody gets run over, mm-hmm. right? And in, in a horrible circumstance, everybody has the same reaction into their phones as if they're watching it right there. And that reaction, um, it scales where you have thousands and millions of people reacting to a very specific event without that reaction that they're having actually being good or necessary or needed at all. You don't like all that adrenaline. What do you do with that? Mm-hmm. Translate it into language and then put it on the internet and then translate it, I guess, into political action about, you know, gun control or something like that. Right. So we're, we're still, we're still monkeys, you know, like the, the monkey's alive, but like, what do you do with the monkey when you're stimulating it with something that is actually a fiction? Um, mm-hmm. And being able to navigate that, you know, I, I think that I think that we're very early with social media, and and there's a, there's a very um, there's a very rich um, kind of inquiry into the evergreen event uh, about how social media. Uh, affected and was involved in what happened and then what happened after what happened and then what's still happening now. Um, because the, the students all use Facebook to, to coordinate and, and to rile each other up. And, and one of the key events that led to it, which wasn't, had any, had nothing to do with the day of absence was one student made fun of another student and they're both students of color, but because one was black, the other was native American, the black person was able to be more offended uh, and, and rally everybody up oh, against the, that's the so Native American man. It's interesting yeah. that they would even have worked out that calculus. You know, I mean, the the common, um, I guess, argument that just gets lodged against intersectionality almost immediately is that it would actually be impossible to quantify someone's mm. relative privilege or oppression uh, on an yeah. individual basis, right? Yeah, no. Yeah, no, it, it, it's uh, I, my first evergreen video was talking about how the college had failed principally because they were trying to teach a sociological view of humans without an interpersonal view of humans. And I used a really kind of just basic analogy about teaching somebody, which came from my experience there, of teaching a child to say please and thank you. And it's not about the words please or thank you. It's about the content of recognizing the individual that is serving you so that so that we're all interdependent and just being aware constantly that other people are helping you and, and you're, you know, and you need to help other people by just recognizing them. And one thing that I saw within the first few months of Evergreen is that this is my pithy quote that empowerment without etiquette is just a license to be an asshole, right? They were teaching all this stuff about empowerment, but nothing about how to, you know, treat people kindly. They were teaching all about power dynamics, but Mm -hmm. they weren't teaching about the proper wielding of power, right? So there was no practice of, there was no ability for the students once they had finally, you know, the dam broke to regulate their behavior. There was nothing in place to regulate their behavior. All of that, all of that horrible childish behavior, they were all a bunch of toddlers. Mm-hmm. Had There was no restraint 
for it. Yeah. And and the, and even George Bridges, who was in the position of power, had no ability to restrain them because that was left out of the equation. Everybody was just, uh, uh, you know, a pawn in this intergalactic historical you know, pool uh, game. And then mm-hmm. they even in their language, they, constantly they say that they are bodies, right? right. They, they dehumanize themselves, which means ultimately that they have no responsibility. Their bodies their moving actions. in space. <laughs> yeah, they're just bodies, you know, like being oppressed, just bodies being oppressed. You know? Well, yeah, yeah. So that's a good point. There is um, this complementary teaching about how do you interact on an interpersonal level. Um, mm. As someone who comes from a background in political theory, and this is ostensibly a mm. political theory podcast, in mm. the field of political theory, we talk a lot about what it means to live a good life, uh, how humans are inherently necessarily political beings, and therefore figuring out what it would mean to be a good citizen and therefore good to your neighbors and the people around you is actually an essential question that you have to yeah. sort of understand in yourself mm. to operate uh, in a democratic society. Um, so I think that's a good point that you make there with the compliment, but I guess I would just, I would just say that it's, it's even more basic than that, which is that you're just looking at the wrong level of abstraction, right? You're committing a type error by switching mm. from this group analysis and then trying to say that that, uh, implies inductively to the, an individual that you happen to be interacting with, right. At any mm. given point. So like for myself, mm. Uh, I'm half Jewish and, um, you know, the fact that I'm Jewish may tell you, uh, it may give you some degree of certainty about making certain guesses about where some of my ancestors might've been in the past or what kind of hardships they may or may not have dealt with. But in general, on an individual level, it doesn't really tell you anything. And Mm -hmm. even if we were going to do this in a non-sociological way, let's say that we were trying to figure out epidemiological data or something like that, uh, the fact that I'm half Jewish might tell you something about my potential susceptibility to certain diseases or to certain, you know, genetic anomalies or so on and so forth that other groups suffer from from, uh, at a lesser rate. But ultimately, those would only be... um, those would only be guesses, right? Those would only be guesses based on large amounts of data. And until you did individualized tests on me uh, mm. or sequence my genome or something like that, you would not be able to really infer anything. Yeah, yeah. And the question then is, how do you build into collective action? How do, how do you cross the divide in in a better way than what Evergreen ended up doing? And And they're still doing it. They're still teaching the same thing. They, 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 just last week, they released you know, the State of the College Address, and they said that the things that happened in 2017 were because they weren't social justice enough. Mm-hmm. Like, they, they, they have, they, they, their causality is totally messed up. But how do you work from the individual into the collective in a proper manner? Because we have to, be, we have to think collectively. We have to act collectively. We need to have... You know, we, we are countries now. We are empires now, you know, and how do, how do we stack back up? Or how do you create a society that respects and cultivates the citizen and still is able to protect and cultivate the, the, the society when dealing with other societies? So I have a question for you now. Now, I know that you're a few years past all of this. Uh, I believe you graduated in, in 2018. Is that correct? 17, yeah. 2017. And... Mm-hmm. So you're you're at least three years out now, um, or yeah. getting close to that. Uh, your channel has obviously expanded to take on a, a lot of different people. I I look on there and I see guests that you've interviewed from a variety of different, you know, mm. political positions, uh, and uh, you're tackling a lot of this not the same, but a lot of a lot of the culture war issues that were. Mm. related to the ideological um, traps that we've been talking about that were Mm. sort of made their presence in Evergreen and was the uh, spark for your actions on YouTube. Where do you see your project going um, for right now in the future? And and how do you think that's evolved? Um, Where am I going now? I don't know where I'm headed next. (laughs) It has been a question. Oh, no, I I love it. Um, it's been really interesting because for whatever reason, I am, for good and for bad, I'm designed to operate with attention. I don't feel like I'm 
complete unless I am commanding attention, unless I have some sort of circuit operating operating on a on a consistent basis where I'm getting feedback that people are listening to me, people are seeing me, people are responding to me. I and that I don't know. I, I don't. We don't need to get too um, psychological about it, other than to say that there's something about me that makes me want to be an entertainer. That makes me want to be in front of people. I really, I, it's not even that I want it. It's that I don't feel good unless I'm getting that. I, I really, I go into wow. depression if I'm not interacting with groups of people. And that, that led me early on before I you know, knew how to get in front of an audience to working with children. And I spent a lot of time working in daycare because that's where I could be a performer and an entertainer and an individual at the same time and not lose myself in that whole ego trapping, which was a very big danger when I was young and, and beautiful and, and <laughs> filled with lust and rage for, for certain things in life, um, which is thankfully calmed down. Um, so when I got the attention, which was really surprising to me, I, and I was very lucky. I was shared by an evolutionary biologist, Jerry Coyne, I believe. Mm -hmm. My first video was shared by him, and that was my first audience. I mean, YouTube picked me up, so there's a YouTube audience, but I also was very gifted to have an intellectual audience from the get-go, um, you know, like a, a precursor to the IDW, so people who read, uh, you know, Chronicle of Higher Ed more than they read Newsweek or, you know, read the, the SJW breakdown videos that were very popular and thankfully maybe not. They seem to have gone out of fashion. But um, when I got that, I, I went through a process of, of trying to figure out, well, what do I do? Do I be funny? Do I be serious? Do I do this? Do I do that? And there was a few months where I was just wearing crazy hats because people kept on sending me hats and I was, I was, I was a goofball. And, um, and then I was doing a lot of work where I just read, which is still popular on YouTube. You, you read an op-ed, you read a news story and you break it down. And, and, um, I was, I was enjoying that. I was practicing that, but I, th there was something about me that was becoming too snarky and too cynical. And I was always dealing with things that I disliked always and, 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 uh, being, being the critic. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I just felt it start to cause me a lot of anxiety. And I, I I'm, I'm always having feedback, not only with the world, but with myself, like my, my emotions are always telling me things and I try to read them correctly. So I, so I'm maintaining some sort of balance. Um, and then I, so I took a step back after doing the, really the, the, the kind of the, the critical YouTuber thing, because it was becoming a part of me. And I don't like, like we said before we started recording, like my, my, my channel, mm -hmm. my product is all named me. Like there's yeah. not, there's not a big difference between who I really am and, and what I'm producing. And I try to keep that important. Uh, I try to keep that central so I can mouth off and I can be serious and I can go through all these different actions and actor be all these different actors. But those are just me acting in a certain way. It always comes back and collapses on who is this person? He's Benjamin Boyce. You get a sense of him. So what has been a great uh, gift and this is discovering that I'm not bad at interviewing people and that when I do interview people, um, the audience really gets a side of the person that I interview that, that they don't get from anybody else. I'm able to allow people to explore themselves in a way that, that is, I, that I think is valuable. Um, I don't mean that in saying that I'm anything special, but I'm allowed to let people see other people in a certain way. And, and that helps me balance out because I have to do those 10 minute snarky videos, you know, I'm kind of going after Bernie Sanders and I like the guy and I don't have a big problem with the left, but I have some deep problems with certain aspects of progressivism that I don't want to go national. I don't want the evergreen uh, mento, uh, 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 telos or, or, you know, like the, mm -hmm. that mindset to go national. And so I'm going to, I'm going to call that out. But I, I, I'm, when I do those little snarky videos, I get pushed back and, and people, the, the people who argue with me in good faith, I end up having them on and, and giving the other side of you, you know, and, and going back to like, I'm just having an opinion. 
I don't, I don't hold an opinion. I, I have to, but I have to voice them. And, and so that feedback loop of going through and always like having a bedrock of one, the big documentary work two the, the interview work and three, the, the stuff that pays the bills or at least generates views and clicks, you know, which is throwaway content anyways. But, um, mm-hmm. I, that's how I conceive of me triangulating those three levels of content. And so I'm going to continue with that. Um, and it just, it depends on what, topic I can really get into, which I don't know what's the next one. I've done the transgender thing pretty thoroughly. I have about 120 interviews on that. And then the evergreen thing, which will be wrapped up by in a couple of months here. Yeah. It's the, the evergreen content, uh, pun intended. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I just, uh, that's interesting because, you know, uh, the, the point you made about the, the, the personal aspect of your channels um, mm-hmm. how they're identified with your name and how that actually gives you a certain amount of flexibility uh, yeah. in terms of like... And accountability uh, too. The audience getting to witness not just one side of this person that they're presenting. Obviously, it is a presentation at the end of the day. You're yeah. producing a product. Uh, but it, it does give you this interesting leeway where you can really show all sides of yourself and it's not necessarily as susceptible to the claim of, oh, you're just being inauthentic to get clicks or, oh, you're mm. just, you know, mm. doing – you're just pandering or something like that because mm. a, as long as you're authentically um, putting out where you're at in that stage of your development, yeah. Yeah. then it totally makes sense. That's a really interesting perspective. Well, you know, and that's that's one of the things that – I want to tackle, and one of the things I think that we've lost, which 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 maybe never existed in the first place, or maybe only existed for a very short period of time, was the ability to let human being be much bigger than any given point of what they're being in the moment. You know, like with with going through people's Twitter feed to find that one time they used the N word, you know, thirty years ago when they were a teenager. You know, or mm-hmm. you know, like like this collapsing of the ability for a human being to change change and to to adapt and to model to model change which is like the, the the what defines a novel according to certain researchers or theorists is that a novel shows a human being going through character development you know and, and the the stories that we love the most are where the the character starts here and ends up over here and and i i fear that we've lost that we've we've collapsed that and i'm trying you know like one of the, one of my one of the reasons that I continue to do this work is to try to give the, give other people the ability to model that and to model that myself, like as an act of ultimate good faith, like, look, I'm going to be wrong here, but I'm still going to go after certain aspects of the Bernie Sanders campaign, you know, or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm going to go against the grain and I, I'm going to criticize this individual that I know a lot of you guys like, but it needs to happen and teach me more, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So one of the other questions I've had then, uh, or I have for you is, you, you said that like, you know, for example, lately you've been focusing a lot on uh, working out the trans issues. And, you know, you're not just doing this from like a one-sided perspective. You've had a lot of uh, trans identifying guests on uh, that I've seen who, you know, are giving their perspective as we alluded to earlier. Many of them uh, disagree with the way that they're being portrayed by people who claim to represent them. Uh, yeah. But how do you avoid this trap of getting mired in always being against something, that thing that you talked about mm. earlier, of where especially when you're talking about sensitive topics related to mm. issues of the culture war, one of the mm. things for me in starting this show was that we wanted to present a positive vision for yeah. what a new politics could look like and not just define ourselves in opposition to something else. So how do you avoid that pitfall? Yeah. Yeah, that's something that I was I was very against against Ness from a very you know from from like the beginning of my adult life. I looked at people who were activists, you know, and and I was growing up in, I guess I, I came of age, quote unquote, in the mid nineties, mm-hmm. um, and so there was a lot of uh, you know fallout from the hippie generation and and fallout from various different activist groups, and I saw that the way in which people come to identify themselves is that they're not something else, and I. I I felt that that was so constraining, you know, I guess, I guess underlying a lot of my, and this is how I look at a a lot of people's behaviors. Like people are acting a certain way because there's something else going on. They're working something else out. So I don't know exactly what I'm working. I think there was a Jordan Peterson quote I came across not too long ago. He said, where he said that 
if you want to know what you believe, look at how you act because you're much more com- complex than y- you're able to actually understand. So watch your behavior and examine that instead of like saying that this is what you believe. And, um, so one, one thing is like, how do you be against something? How do I be against, uh, the direction that evergreen has, has been going, um, even if they're not going to change, they don't want to change, or the people who do want to change aren't able to have any effect in that. How do I be against activists um, but still allow for society to aright itself for different programs to come into existence?